I went over a number of strategies I've learned while running our investor club the last 17 years. Um, I'm relatively young for the family office industry. As you can imagine, 17 years ago, how young I looked to most senior people in the industry. But because of that, we had to put out a ton of thought leadership, interview hundreds of family offices. And over the last 17 years, I have written um, 13 books. We've hosted 275 live events. We have more thought leadership on family offices than all of the competitors combined globally. Um, we are interviewing 100 billionaires publicly at billionaires.com. And we've featured over 3,000 speakers over time at our live in-person investor club events. So our last event was in Beverly Hills. We had a couple billionaire keynote speakers, a shark from Shark Tank, the founder of Gold's Gym, who sold 700 locations, gave a keynote. At a next event in New York City, um, we're going to be having three billionaire keynotes. We have the executive producer behind the Sound of Freedom movie, um, as well as 125 speakers over three days on stage. So I wanted to give that context because you might be wondering, you know, should I stay here? Should I watch this whole thing? Am I in the right place? But if you are a private investor, if you are someone that is building an investment platform, building a company, and you're curious how most billionaires have built their wealth, how most family offices think, what we're doing is taking everything we've learned the last 17 years and providing you a lot of that information here. Um, maybe two minutes, we'll be mentioning, you know, what we do on the investment side of things, how our investor club called the family office club operates, and the rest of it is just going to be pure value coming from me to you. And I hope it is the most valuable webinar that you are on in 2024. So I appreciate you being here with us. I'm going to share my screen now and start flipping through some slides. So uh, first off, we're going to be going over billionaire, centimillionaire, and family office strategies. A family office is simply a wealth solution for the ultra wealthy. If you're worth 10, 20, 30, hundreds of millions of dollars, you need to manage your wealth differently than if you're worth $100,000 or $1 million, right? So that's what a family office is. And a centimillionaire is somebody worth $100 million plus. All right, so here's my team. We've got 25 different professionals on our team that help us get everything done, of course. So very proud of them. And that's how we put on um, our live events within our investor club with more ultra wealthy investors on stage than any other events. Um, one of our divisions is passive income partners. Um, that is our joint venture, the $6 billion in AUM uh, real estate group, been in business for 15 years and they have annual financial audits, only a one year lockup. Um, and be happy to discuss what we do in that division with any of you if you'd like to. Um, getting There's a flight to quality right now in the marketplace, so that's why we have Passive Income Partners out there. If you want to learn more, go to PassiveIncomePartners.com. Um, before we get into um, some personal side of things for two or three slides, we also love working with doctors and dentists. So we have minority equity stakes ranging from 1% to 50% to equity in about 35 different medical practice locations. They do about 70 million a year in revenue, and that division is called Medical Clinic Capital. So uh, we have this investor club, and then we also learn a lot by scaling passive income partners and medical clinic capital. Um, so this is my home team, since I showed you my investment team. It's my wife there when we went down across the Grand Canyon and back one time. It's my three daughters, um, and we live in Scottsdale. We're just about to relocate to Oahu, Hawaii here, short term now. This is them working out with me in Croatia at the gym last year. Uh, pretty much whatever we do, and they like to tag along. I like to do a lot of backpacking. I'm going to Machu Picchu next month. I went to um, Nepal to Everest Base Camp um, last year for my birthday, and we're usually doing two to four big backpacking trips or international fun trips per year with just the guy friends or the whole family or just my wife, etc. This is us on, in uh, Everest Base Camp on my birthday. Super fun. Uh, it was my wife doing rim to rim to rim with me. Uh, it was about 45 mile hike in one day. We, we like doing these types of uh, personal challenge things, adventure travel. That's pretty much what we live for. So that's in Havasupai Falls. All right. So <clears throat> now I want to jump right into the content. And what I'm going to do is cover a few slides that are fundamental for understanding how we think, what we've learned successful people do, and how they operate. And probably 25% of the content today is going to be about mindset of the ultra wealthy and the ultra successful. So if you don't know David Goggins' story, he was a 300 pound uh, bug exterminator, not happy, went around with a smile on his face, pretending to be happy and saw some Navy SEALs on TV. And he said, that's what I need. 
I need to be one of them and I will change my life. And he went into the recruitment office. They literally laughed him out of there and said, you have to lose like 70 to 90 pounds to even get in for the tryouts. And he went and he did that. And then he tried out, became a Navy SEAL, has sold millions of copies of his books, um, holds a world record for number of pull-ups in a day, um, and is one of the toughest human beings out there. So he really, he really saw what he was capable of through pushing himself. And I love his messaging that you don't wanna be average. Average is not good. If you're on this webinar, it's, you don't wanna be average, right? Otherwise you would just allocate to some stock index and, or just trust some wealth advisor down the street and not self-direct anything, right? Most of you are entrepreneurs or doctors or real estate investors, and you have that in your blood to have some control over your destiny. And you know that if you give up all control to your destiny, you'll be average at best and maybe chasing average at best, right? None of us want that. And none of the successful people I know think that way. I don't want this webinar to be average because a lot of conferences and webinars can get pretty dry with a bunch of graphs and economic statistics and stuff like that. So I'll move pretty quick here. Um, I want to share this story because it relates to the public mentality of being average and being like everyone else. So my brother did a 10 hour workout at Orange Theory. And if you know Orange Theory, they usually have you do 40 to 50 minute workouts and some stretching at the end. And my brother did every class that they offer in one day at Orange Theory. He posted it to the Orange Theory social media page and everybody just destroyed him. They said, oh, that's unhealthy. They shouldn't allow that. That's a liability for Orange Theory. Oh, this is bad. Take it down. Someone's going to see that and have a stroke. To me, it was fascinating because it was not in the New York Times. It was not on some random website that people found on Google. It was on a workout community social media page. And everybody only had negative things to say. And I said, guys, if anything, we should be making fun of the person who already, like Goggins used to, weighed 300 pounds and is downing a gallon of Coca-Cola. That is not good for them. It's just like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. We shouldn't be beating up on the person who wants to push their physical limits and become ultra healthy, right? But my point is that in public, in the public world today and in media, people do not like it when you do things that are not average, right? That is very scary to them, but you have to get used to that. And anyone who gets something big done in life is doing something that is far from average, right? So just like the disclaimer that you've heard on other webinars, anything you hear on this webinar or any conference the rest of your life, you know, make sure you can actually go forward and act on the advice and the insights and that it makes sense for you and that you know, your risk appetite aligns, aligns with the risk that comes with that. So um, we're gonna go through a whole bunch of strategies and you know, I can't say that caveat every time that we mention one, of course. Always do your due diligence as well. As I mentioned before, um, if you need a third party due diligence package, we are affiliated with Verified Diligence um, and you can reach out to me via email with questions you have during this webinar if you want to. Uh, my email is richard at investorclub.com. Um, and you can check out more about our verified due diligence packages completed by a, a third party at verifieddiligence.com. Okay, so Family Office Club is the name of our organization. We now actually have 12 million followers across our social media channels, not 10 million. So we need to update that number. Um, we've completed well over 100 transactions within our community. And we've just learned a ton while operating our business. So that's what we're going to be sharing here today. Um, First thing I wanna set as the foundation for the webinar here is that the people who get the most done strive to be a class act human being. It doesn't mean that they don't need to be direct with people sometimes. It doesn't mean that some people might think that they're slightly rude or that some people get offended that they don't reply to their very important email, that there's just no time of the day to reply to everybody. Um, but going out of your way to be a really good human being and be good to your team is to your advantage. And it's the only way to build a big, a good reputation, right? Sam Zell is a billionaire famous for saying he doesn't want anyone to do a deal with him once. He wants to do a deal with people over and over again. Jeff Hoffman is a billionaire who came and gave a second talk at my event in Beverly Hills two weeks ago. And he said that not only is it, there's nothing bad with making a lot of money. It's only bad if you don't do anything good with it. But he says, you need to figure out what's most important to your employees and then drive goals towards that. You just making the business bigger is your goal as a CEO, not potentially your employee's goal. So if you're running a business, running a platform, these are all things just to keep in mind um, and doing things that are the right things to do by your employee is what will keep them more loyal, right? It's not like you're only being a good human being just out of the goodness of your heart. It's also not only just the right thing to do, but it's the profitable thing to do if you want a loyal team, if you want a good reputation, if you want clients that want to do deals with you and work with you over and over again. 
So this theme has come up while studying billionaires and the ultra wealthy. Um, and it is not in line with how the media portrays the ultra wealthy uh, as very slick, aggressive, you know, typically they position them as something evil. Um, also, as people grow their investment platforms and grow to become ultra wealthy, they usually are becoming institutional quality. They're patient. A no doesn't always mean a no, but do you get insulted when there's a no? Do you get upset when somebody doesn't reply to your email within six days? Uh, can you be concise? When someone offers you time to have a phone call or meeting, do you set the phone call for an hour or ask them if they have a half day to meet? That shows it's your first rodeo and you don't work with busy people very often. Busy people, their most valuable phone calls last eight to 12 minutes, are done via text message or audio message, or at most are 15 minutes long, unless it is a board meeting, an acquisition of a major asset, a major joint venture, there needs to be an agenda for the meeting and need to be very concise. Institutional quality means polished and professional and, and you're taking it seriously, right? We were the number two investor in Access Loans before we sold it to a billionaire. You can see what we did on the redesign of that logo, which my team handled. Um, if you're watching along visually, um, if you need access to these slides to look at afterwards, just shoot me that email at richard at investorclub.com and we will send you those slides over. Um, if you are following along visually, you can see the second example here. A company was called Dynastic Development. We turned it into CRE Construction Partners. All right, so one of the most valuable things that I can convey to you on this webinar, I wanted to put here near the front, and that is that until I had ran our investor club for a decade, I did not realize how powerful and how much of a game changer it was to go down the rabbit hole of structuring investments in more intelligent ways. I don't know how many times I have met someone who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They've never structured more than one or two deals in their life, maybe just the exit of their company. Many smaller investors are in the same boat. They might be a high earning doctor. They might be a high income business person and they don't know how to structure investments at all. And they're starting on ground zero. If you don't know how to structure investments, you don't know what to negotiate. You don't know if you're getting a raw deal or not. And you could show me a deal which is potentially very profitable. But if you let me structure it for me in a way that's bad for you, then that very profitable deal can be horrible for you. And likewise, you could show you a deal that's average at best, but if we structure it, so you get all the collateral, you get all the cash out first, you get all the transparency, all the reporting and all the voting rights, then it can be made into an amazing deal, right? So in some ways, the structure of the deal is more critical and more powerful than the actual merits of the deal itself. So very important to become an expert on this. We don't have time to go through every strategy, but is there alignment in the deal? Does the cash get recycled or spit out? Who gets dividends first? Does anyone get a preferred return? Is it a co-GP deal or a GPLP deal? Are there multiple share classes of the LLC? Who has control? Who can get diluted? Who needs to vote in order to sell the company or asset? Who values the asset? Can somebody sell to a sister company at a low price so you get less of a return and then sell it again later to somebody else? There's a hundred things you need to really consider. And overlooking the structure of the deal is the number one mistake that's overlooked that can add the most value. I don't know how many times I've been shown a deal and everyone shows great confidence. Oh, this company is gonna be amazing after you invest your money. And there's assets affiliated with it, medical equipment, industrial equipment, real estate, land. And I don't know how many times I've asked, oh, well, can we just have some assurances that you know if everything goes bust, which you've told us you're very sure is not gonna happen, um, that we're made whole through the real estate or the equipment. And 70% of the time they say yes. If you never ask that question as an investor, you're not gonna get collateral covered. So it's always good to ask that, but if you don't know to ask that very simple question, you could lose all your money in a bad scenario. That's just one quick example of it. Um, I ran through a lot of these examples already on the next slide. Um, I'll send these slides to everybody or make them available in case you want to read these off on your own time. Okay, so now we're gonna to get to my favorite part of the presentation because this is really changing my life right now in real time. Uh, the strategies that we have learned here are scaling our business rapidly. They're, they've scaled our social media following from a couple million to 12 million over the last two years. Um, it's scaling our billionaire interviews from zero to now 40 billionaires interviewed um, out of the 100 that we're aiming for. Um, so I hope you really enjoy this part. Um, <clears throat> starts out with this premise that it is scientifically proven the media we consume changes how we think, right? It's part of the reason why you're listening to this webinar. If you consume lots of Republican media for two years straight and nothing else, you'll think more like a Republican. If you consume a lot of Democrat, liberal media, you'll think more that way. 
Uh, if you read scientific journals on prosthetic limbs for a couple of years, you're gonna have a lot of that swimming around in your brain and see commonalities or creative combinations with other things in your life. And so that's scientifically proven, it's not a debate. And the type of specialized knowledge you allow into your brain changes how you interpret, how you feel, how you see, how you think, all of that. So we are, you know, if you take that assumption, that proven fact, and put that to the side now, if we can all agree on that. Now, let's say you wanna learn anything. It could be about stem cells, investing in medical practices, investing in real estate. How do you learn how to do that? How do you learn how to scale a business? How do you learn how to scale your balance sheet and scale your net worth? Well, you could go to somebody who's equivalent of a Duke University basketball player, right? Um, there's lots of them out there. Some of them may do coaching or mentorship or have written a book. Um, so you could do that and you'd probably learn more than if you talk to a high school player or just watch random YouTube videos or people who claim to be good at basketball because this person's a star in the Duke University team, right? So it's not a horrible place to start. This though is equivalent to what a lot of people are doing right now to learn how to invest and learn how to grow their business. They're learning from Duke University level people. You could learn from Michael Jordan, right? And if you could do that, it would not make sense to learn from the average NBA player. You'd wanna be like Kobe and be mentored directly from Jordan, whether that's in person, if you're that lucky, or through his books or through his interviews, et cetera, right? So there's no comparison between getting you know, mentored by someone like this versus someone like that. Um, but when I had 800 people in a room and I said, how many people here have read more than 20 books written by a billionaire, only one person's hand went up, but everyone in the room had read way more than 20 books. I bet most business people have read 50 books, a hundred books, a couple hundred books. Um, I know some billionaires that read a, a couple hundred books per year. Um, but just the average business person I read, bet has read 50 or a couple hundred books, but you're mostly reading books by people who are really good at marketing their books. They're not really good at business compared to billionaires, but there's over 240 books written by billionaires. Most people didn't know that. I have a list of them. If you want that list, I'm gonna be showing a QR code later. You can scan that with your phone or just shoot me an email if you can't follow along visually with the, the slides and uh, richard at investorclub.com and I'll send you that list. Um, but what would happen to your brain if you only allowed specialized knowledge directly from billionaires in, into your head? And one of my good friends asked me yesterday, oh, have you read Elon Musk's book? And I was like, no, Elon Musk has not written a book, not that I know of. I know um, that there is a very famous autobiographer uh, who has written a book on Elon, but I'm not talking about books written on billionaires. I want the ideas directly in the billionaire's own words from their brains directly, not someone else interpreting what they think the billionaire thought or what they assume the billionaire was trying to do. I wanna hear it directly from the billionaire. So this is, these are some of my favorite books ever written by billionaires. I've read 76, almost 77 now of the 240, hoping to get at least halfway done this year and get to 120 of them read. But I'd recommend you read all 25 of these books. Each one I believe is worth over $100,000 for your career, your business, your investments. Um, and if you get nothing else from this, I would just take a picture of the screen, buy these books, um, and I think they'll change your life, honestly. They're so powerful. So I'll give you just one second to do that and keep on moving. And again, uh, just email me if you need that list. Here's the QR code if you're following along visually. If you wanna take a quick uh, picture of that, you can um, get that list directly. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right into some of the insights now from billionaires. So. One of my friends and mentors, Evan Pagan, he got to interview um, both Bill Gates and Steve Jobs in the same day at a technology conference. He asked both of them, how did you become so amazingly successful? You've had so much go right for you. How did you pull that off? What's interesting is both of them started out saying the same thing. They both admitted they didn't get everything right. Steve Jobs says, or uh, we'll start with Bill Gates. He said, uh, well, we didn't get everything right. We had a lot of things that didn't work, but once we had one monster success, which was Microsoft Windows, the operating system, then we just hired great managing directors and the business grew and we became huge. Um, Steve Jobs said something different. He said, well, we didn't get everything right. We just kept the things that worked, but you know, we really, you really just have to care. In Steve's mind, you really had to care, um, but they didn't get everything right. They're not flawless people. And I think that's maybe something that some people think is like either they got really lucky or they just do everything right. And they're just that smart. They're that much of a genius, but neither one are true. You know, Richard Branson has over 250 companies um, that do tens of billions of dollars a year in revenue. Not all of them have been successful. You know, one of them we tried to launch was, was Virgin Brides. Couldn't find any customers, so they didn't make it. Um, this is a book I recommend you read. It's very timely for where we are in the market right now. 
It's by Howard Marks, billionaire, founder of Oak Tree Capital, called The Most Important Thing. And by reading this book, the number one takeaway I got was that when people think that you are not smart to be even considering investing at such a bad time, that's when you get a 10 or 20% discount by investing at a bad time. When people think you are an idiot for investing, like this is a toxic area, nobody in their right mind would ever be investing right now. That's when you get the best deals of a decade or sometimes a lifetime. And I think right now when the economy is shaky, people don't believe in the stock prices that are going on, when there is inflation, um, when there's volatile things happening with, with gold or Bitcoin, et cetera, um, going against the herd is important and you'll never become ultra wealthy by chasing the herd. So that's, that's one takeaway I've gotten by studying them. I got to interview Tony Robbins last year, and it's a, just a short 13 minute interview. You can listen to that at billionaires.com. Um, top two takeaways were that he worked harder when he had 10 million a year in revenue than he does now at 10 billion, because now he's in owner mode, not operator mode. In owner mode, you can be, as Sam Zell says, he wants to be the chairman of everything and the CEO of nothing. If you're turning all the cranks yourself, you are your bottleneck and you need to get out of your own way. He also said that he made $400 million off of one investment transaction because of the power of proximity. So definitely check out that interview with Tony when you can. Uh, David Rubenstein is a productivity master. And what I found is that to become ultra wealthy, most of these folks are very fast moving. Um, Bezos is famous for saying once you have 70% of the data or information, you just have to make a decision and go. Uh, Rubenstein's right-hand man, uh, Chris, I've been speaking to lately, um, he says that David is always moving. His goal is to read 300 books this year. He doesn't watch any TV. He's hyper-responsive to all messages coming in, and he loves it. He's on multiple boards. He's excited about what he's doing. And that's something I've realized with billionaires is that they only work on exciting things. The ultra-wealthy do. Why would they work on anything that's not fun? or anything that's just linear and not exponential. It doesn't make any sense, right? Because if they wanted to, they could just not work. Many of us who are on this call right now, if we wanted to, we could move to Bali and live in Indonesia or middle of nowhere, Nebraska, and probably never work another day in our life, right? But that doesn't sound fun, doesn't sound challenging, and is not the type of legacy we want to live, right? Uh, we're not done seeing what we're capable of. So being really productive and having extreme focus are some commonalities I've found between the ultra wealthy. And then I go into that second point here in a little bit. Scalability, looking for something that can really scale to 50 million, 100 million, billions of dollars, obviously is required if you're gonna go big. It also means not selling out early. Uh, it means only focusing on ideas that are really gonna move the needle. I don't know how often I have to turn down ideas that are just so far from something that I should be accepting that it's interesting that people even pitch the idea. So if you're like me and you own several businesses and you have a successful business that you own 100% of and somebody says, would you like to join our board and have half a percent equity in this company? It's just an hour a month and then a quarterly meeting for a couple hours. It's like, well, if you focus that time on your own business, you get 100% of any growth that comes from that. If I focus my time on building their business, I get 0.5% at best if I don't get diluted, if the company doesn't go out of business, if I don't get uh, left without a chair and somehow don't get any of the returns because something happens to the founder or there's a dispute or something like that. Um, you know, It is literally 400 times more valuable to focus on building my own business than sit on somebody's board for half a percent equity, right? Um, so you have to think that way and think about scalability, but also season and window. When you see an opportunity, you have to go for it with conviction. And I'm not a fan of risking everything to go for an opportunity, but like Warren Buffett says, when it pours, you have to get out buckets and not thimbles, right? So you need to really be willing to go big on something. Um, and Bezos is famous for saying in his interviews that many decisions are not fatal and people debate on them too much. And it's more expensive to debate on it than just to make the decision. And most decisions are reversible. If they don't wanna sell cars on amazon.com, then they could reverse that decision. They're not gonna go out of business unless they get ridiculous amount of debt and risk their whole balance sheet, which would be hard for Amazon to do at this point. Um, but you get my point, it's like most decisions are reversible. So moving with conviction, but also looking at what's scalable and seizing an opportunity when it's right in front of you. Realize when you're getting lucky is something that a couple billionaires have brought up uh, to us over time. We just interviewed uh, Michael, a billionaire from Jamaica, and his industry grew 400x since he started 
in the space and now it's 400 times bigger. He chose an industry that he thought was inevitably going to grow. It did. And now he became a billion dollar plus net worth because of that. So he chose a scalable industry and really sees that opportunity. Um, another one that's connected to that is like, you, you really don't get big by settling for small. If you sell out early, then you'll be done. If you have a mess like the Paychex founder, Tom did, I've read two of his books now. He made one offer to the franchise owners and if only half would have accepted, it would have been a mess. Maybe he could have survived it, but it wouldn't be nearly as strong as he was by unifying everybody with one buyout offer to take all the franchise paychecks locations, get them into one, and then really scale it to be billion dollar plus and go public. Cuban was offered $150 million for broadcast.com at one point, And he said, no, I'm not taking that. I'm going for the billion dollar level. And Cuban was not worth a lot outside of his company at that point. Uh, Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger, if you've seen his documentary, um, if you have read his book, which is amazing, I'm reading it to my kids right now. Every night before they go to bed, I read them five to 10 pages and they love it. Um, after he became Mr. Olympia four or five times, he got bored doing that and said, oh, I'm gonna be a movie star. People would offer him a supporting role, a character role, a background scene as a, as a um, bodyguard or a bouncer at a dance club or a military character. And he said, no, I'm not taking any of those roles. I'm going for the leading man role. And he became the number one highest paid male actor in the world. So it takes a vision for aiming at something really big and there's three episodes to Arnold's documentary. The opening line, I think, was very carefully scripted, and it summarizes the whole documentary. The opening line of it, it shows, it shows Arnold, and he says, my whole life, I've been able to visualize where I want to go, what I want to do, and because I can visualize it so clearly, I work hard until that becomes my reality. And I find that common among the ultra wealthy is that they are aiming for something really big. They don't accidentally become big. You know, Cuban didn't accidentally become worth a billion dollars plus after getting a $150 million offer, right? Uh, one of my favorite quotes from a billionaire is Cubans. He says, you don't need to have all the capital in the world. You just need to outwork and outlearn everybody around you. And I think that's an inspiring quote to hear from someone like that, because it means that whoever you are listening to this, if you outwork and outlearn and focus on a high value niche that you're naturally good at, have an edge at, or early on, and you stick at it, um, then you will succeed. That's what Jeffrey Gittimer taught me, and that's what I've done for 17 years in the family office space, and I have succeeded because of what Cuban said, outworking and outlearning others that just don't wanna work as hard, don't read every book ever written by a billionaire or by family offices, et cetera. And that's been the key to our success. So I really love spreading that type of message because I know it's genuinely true and authentic and will really help somebody listening to this. Lots of people look at me, people a hundred times more successful than, than I am. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, it's always working, work, work, work. You know, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, they also sometimes think, oh, all they care about is work. There's workaholics. But to most of the ultra wealthy, they are excited. It's a fun adventure. They're not seeing it as a huge burden. If it was a big burden, why would they work anymore, right? Why, why, why would Mark Cuban still work? Why would David Rubenstein be on six different boards and still work? He wouldn't, right? He doesn't have to. So um, they choose to because they only work on exciting things. And that's like a, a, a different mindset than most people have or even know they have. So if you want an example of this, you should read the book Built from Scratch, uh, which is from the two co-founders of Home Depot. And from the very beginning, when they opened their first location, their goal was to have a thousand plus locations. That was for sure not an accident. And it was a completely different business model. They were not chasing somebody else. They created this business model. And that's one thing that, that I found. Um, I got introduced to this through Vern Harnish in his book, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Evan Pagan recommended I read that book. Um, and my, the best chapter of that book is the one on strategic choke points. So a strategic choke point is something that once you acquire it, everything becomes easier, it goes faster, you're more profitable, your costs go down, or you have some sort of strategic edge that makes your company stronger. Um, there's all different types of choke points out there. In the movie 300, if you've seen it, an army of 300 defends against 5,000 because there's a canyon and it's only two people wide. And so the army of 300 would just kill whatever two people would come through there at a time and they held them off for thousands of people. So in the Middle East, the, there's a choke point in the Red Sea where a lot of traditionally energy flows through there and conflicts in the Middle East right now are 
um, you know, disturbing that balance of peace there. And there's a lot of military bases right by that point in the Middle East. Um, and it's because of the strategic importance of it. So in your business, you have to think, what is a strategic choke point? For me, having some of the only books and the best-selling books on many topics in the family office industry helps. Um, for me, having billionaires.com and then making that into the number one most visited, most helpful, most in-depth website on billionaire strategies um, is something I believe is a real choke point. For other people, it might be a piece of intellectual property. It might be your role in a charitable organization full of business partners that you could connect with. And as long as you do a good job leading that charity, then you'll have that position for five or 10 or 20 years and your network will keep on growing, right? It's a, it's a choke point because once you secure it, nobody else can, at least not easily or without cooperating with you. So it turns competitors into cooperators. It leads to collaboration. It leads to reputation growth. It leads to more deal flow, better investment terms. And one of the most powerful one sentence pieces of advice I can give everyone here is that if you as an investor or business person can see deals, can see opportunities first, you get the first look at them, you get to see them exclusively somehow, or you get to see them at a better valuation, then your balance sheet will skyrocket. Um, because coming into things at half of the valuation of other people, sometimes even getting free equity in companies, um, can make all the difference in the world. Let me give you an example. We got approached by a company that wanted our help over time. They said, well, Richard, we want you to have some skin in the game. So I said, okay, well, why don't I buy 2.5% of your company? You put me on your advisory board and I am gifted another 2.5% in the form of advisory shares. So I got 5% of the company and I only had to buy 2.5%. Another group came to me and they had a decent track record, really great people, both Eagle Scouts, just like I am. Um, and they offered without any negotiation, 33 to 50% of their company to give to me without me having to invest anything. I said, you know what guys, there's two of you, there's me, let's all be equal partners. I don't want the 50%, I want you to be super motivated. I want you to feel it's fair. And I don't have a lot of time, what I have is resources, exposure, capital connections, strategies, structures. I can massively change the trajectory of your company, but it's not gonna be on four hour board calls, board meetings, right? So I want you to respect that over time. So let's just be one third partners each. Uh, we had another case where we got a 20% equity stake company uh, for free uh, without having to invest anything. That's rare. Most of the time it's just a better investment valuation or you just get to see the deal first and no one else gets to see it and you get the deal done and no one else gets to even be in the deal. And that can be a real advantage on the best deals. The best deals get done relatively quickly. So figure out for you as an investor, how do you see deals first exclusively and at a better valuation over time? If you need help or feedback on how to do that, again, shoot me an email, richard at investorclub.com and I'll make that point clear. Okay, so these are some strategic choke points that we acquired over time, familyoffices.com, the number one largest networking group for ultra wealthy families on LinkedIn. We then had a best-selling book through Wiley, another one through Wiley, a book through Bloomberg, and then some of the first books on many niches. We then grew um, to having 42 different groups on LinkedIn and have the number one conference series in our industry, buyingbillionaires.com, being the number one social media um, group, networking group in dentistry, and now growing to 12 million uh, followers across our social media channels. You know, our goal over time is to grow to 100 million on social media. And we think that will ensure that we are constantly seeing deals first exclusively and at a better valuation. So I hope by me sharing all those examples of choke points real quick, that it just kind of starts turning the wheels on ones that you could implement yourself. Um, here we have, uh, I mean, next I want to talk about how many times I think people look at someone who's ultra successful and be like, oh, well, you know, what's going on there. They have all the capital in the world and all the reputations and everything goes quickly. But the billionaires don't stop doing what worked before. And what I find worked before is the stacking of strategies. So it wasn't just that they had a lot of capital, capital and a good reputation. They also didn't put up with bad employees. They expect excellence. They also had high quality joint venture partners. They also shut down business models that were not profitable or not worth their time or not scalable or already too crowded they have that going for them. They also had access to the best quality debt, equity, structures, et cetera. When you have the, the best investment structures, the best teams, the best joint venture partners, 
you know yourself well enough because you've been running your business now for 10 or 20 years, then you only focus your time on what you're best at. And you also do what Tony Robbins suggested, be an owner, not, not an operator of your business. When you do all of those different things, the results are exponential, it's not linear. And so I think that is a big takeaway from studying these people is that it's not just looking for that one magic bullet, it's looking at all the levers of success and then getting all those in place so they all compound and you get exponential results. So one thing that um, I've been trying to improve on myself is my ability to focus. Um, Cause I found that extreme focus is something that is required. And it's something that Peter Thiel says is a superpower. And anytime I hear a billionaire talk about a superpower or the number one most important thing, um, I lean forward a bit. And it's just something where, where I'm trying to grow on it. So what does it mean to have extreme focus? Well, the morning after Michael Jordan won his third championship, he was practicing at 5.30 in the morning and a rookie showed up on the court and, they said, and he said at 7 a.m., he said, Michael, what are you doing here? And Michael said, well, a better question is, where were you an hour and a half ago? Right? He really pushed people, but he also pushed himself just as hard, if not harder than anyone else on the team. Right? He didn't say that to the whole team, I'll see you at 5.30 tomorrow morning. He pushed himself that much harder. And it's that focus that led him to be arguably one of the greatest you know, athletes or one of the greatest basketball players. Um, even if you don't think he's number one, he's definitely a top five in most people's minds, right? So one thing is that extreme focus is not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it and it wouldn't really have any value, right? Um, but the goal is not to be normal. The goal is not to be average. So looking at what everyone else does is a bad litmus test of whether you should be doing it or not, right? Um, and sometimes people won't like it when you have extreme focus. I just got a request for someone that I know, they're credible, and they wanted me to get on a phone call this week to talk about partnering with them so that their software could be the investment platform for our whole investor club. But we get a pitch on that every quarter from publicly traded companies, from small groups that give us equity stakes. Of course, they want access to all of our investors, but one, we're not looking for that. It's not a top priority right now. Um, so I have to just nicely decline, like you have to all the time to things that are coming in and say, I'm sorry, it's just not a top priority and getting good at saying no in a hundred different ways is really important, or you cannot have extreme focus. You have to say no to almost everything. And one thing I've learned is that the more successful you get, the more employees you have, the more LLCs, the more investments, you not only have to get better at saying no, because there's more opportunities coming at you, but the opportunities will be more valuable every year and there'll be a higher volume of them. Those are two things that are changing. The other thing that's changing is you are busier. So you're not only busier, but there's more opportunities coming at you and the opportunities are more lucrative. So every year you have to say no to things you would have said yes to last year. Every year you need to come up with new ways to say no. Every year you need to sharpen that saw of being extremely focused or your energy will be dissipated over time. You have to cut out toxins, anchors, energy vampires, that employee you've been meaning to fire, and you just need to do it to mediocre people that are around you. Look at the top 10 sources of stress, especially the top three, and just get them removed from your life. Even if your revenue goes down short term, you're gonna enjoy your life more. It's gonna be more worth all that hard work because you'll be more excited to do everything that you do. Um, Steve Jobs defines extreme focus as deciding on what you wanna do that would really move the needle and transform everything in your business and then anything else that you're looking at that would also be highly profitable, also be exciting, and you are 100% sure that you can make money on that as well, you say no to all of that stuff. He also said you write down your top five priorities that make the company the most money, cross out four of them, and focus on the top one. That is extreme focus, and most people don't do that. Um, they have 20 different priorities, 10 different priorities, five different priorities. So that's very difficult to do, for most companies, having three priorities and knowing what your number one and three is for every division of your company and your business is enough focus and a lot more focus than you're currently doing. But really interesting to hear those statements. Um, Arnold is so focused that he turned down everything else like we talked about, character roles, etc. And he, was, he went to the movies in Austria, saw someone who was in a movie, Hercules, who had been Mr. Olympia and won, and, and won Mr. Olympia. Um, and he tore it off the wall and put it on his wall at home and said, I'm gonna be him. I'm gonna become Mr. Olympia and then be in the movies and be Hercules. He put that on a wall and then he made it real over time through extreme focus. So check out Arnold. We haven't watched that documentary yet, Pure Gold. Um, Jeff Hoffman is one of the billionaires I talked about who just spoke on stage a second time. His 
talk on stage at our super summit two years ago was the number one talk out of 3000 people who have spoken at our events over the last 17 years. So go to billionaires.com and stream that talk. It'll be amazing ideas directly from the brain of a billionaire into your brain and you will not be disappointed. You can listen to it at 1.5 or 2X like anything on YouTube um, because we have that embedded into billionaires.com so you can do that. Um, while Jeff spoke on stage, he said that one of his most um, successful strategies is to put sticky notes on his mirror. So when he brushes his teeth or shaves every morning, he sees his top goals. He sees what he should be focusing on. Um, and I loved when he said that because for over a decade, I have had my one pager up on top on my, uh, where I shave every day in the bathroom. And so I've got some visual um, pictures of people that I look up to on here, but I also have my, my monthly, quarterly, and annual goals. And then these are all one-liner programming statements. So some of these statements um, are to, you know, interview a hundred billionaires. Um, there's two types of suffering, short-term and long-term, Dan Sullivan always said. So choose the short-term suffering and get things over with. Um, you know, when you, have an, when you have an edge, exploit it and go big. We just talked about that a couple of slides ago. Expect excellence make high velocity decisions, say no to things that you know would make you money, but still say no to them. Um, one of the first ones on there is extreme focus is a superpower. These are things I read to myself every single day. And I do that because I wanna go out in the day with my blinders on to what I care about, um, execute in the way that I know I need to execute on the things I've identified would transform my business. Am I focused enough? No. Am I an expert at extreme focus? No. Uh, but it's something I've noticed that the ultra wealthy are pretty good at. And I believe you have to grow that muscle if you're going to do well in business over time and really scale things exponentially. Mark Cuban in a recent interview said that every morning you need to wake up and you need to know your top goals, but you also need to ask yourself, what is the best use of my time today? For example, I have a phone call coming up with the number one billionaire in the country of Nepal. Last year I went to Nepal. It was a life changing trip. Um, I'm going to be spreading the word about this billionaire's book. I want him to come speak at one of our events. He's open to doing all of that. So how do I get a Jeff Hoffman and this billionaire, uh, Benad to kind of back our project and introduce me to five or 10 billionaires they each know and get more of these billionaire interviews done. I'm not quite sure yet, but I need to have extreme focus on that, right? I need to prepare for that. And that's the best use of my time perhaps today. Um, Part of this requires defending your time. I only go to meetings that have agendas. Um, when someone says, oh, well, I just want to brainstorm. Like, okay, well, shoot me over your ideas here. I'm happy to brainstorm over email or an audio message, but I don't do phone calls just to brainstorm or have someone pick my brain. It doesn't really work for me. Um, I strictly set meetings for 15 minutes each, not 30 or 60 minutes. Um, in addition to that, I <clears throat> look to know the agenda for the call. So when people send me the agenda and there's five items there, I say, okay, uh, on point one, yes, I agree, let's do it. Point two, we usually do 3%, not 2.5. So I don't know if you're okay with three, but if it's three, we can, we can move forward, no problem. On point number three, that's a pretty hairy topic, there's regulatory issues to talk about. Why don't, why don't we save that one for the phone call? And on four and five, address those topics. By the time we get on the phone, we're only talking about point number three and the phone call is over in eight to 12 minutes. My most powerful, most valuable phone calls last five to 12 minutes because the person on the other side is extremely busy. Like yesterday, I talked to someone who has a publicly traded company, 11 billion in assets. There's a big way we could work together with medical and dental practices. And it was a very fast phone call, right? We're both very busy. When people say, oh, do you have time to meet? And then they ask for a half day meeting or an hour of your time. Um, it's like, no, I, I really just can't do that. Uh, but I'm happy to be very helpful to you. Um, and getting good it has been to me. And it is that most time that people want to meet or have a phone call or a Zoom, it can be done via email or text or the amount of time needed to meet can be reduced to 15 minutes instead of an hour by them taking 15 minutes to put together a thoughtful email, you taking 15 minutes to reply when you're on an airplane, working on the weekend, et cetera. And they can still connect in person, but you don't have to go ev over everything verbally or everything in person. So I think 90% of meetings could really be taken care of via email and text. The 10% of meetings left, most of those can be done via an audio message. And we love audio messages. We send hundreds of them a day. 
I think it's the newest, most modern, effective way of communicating. Because over email, you can't hear the tone of voice. You don't know if somebody is really upset, if they're stressed, if they're very excited to work with you. And if I send you an audio message and say, hey, Sarah, um, thank you for that message. Very excited to work together. Um, have you ever structured a deal as a co-GP? Or would you be open to doing this as a debt structure instead of equity? Love to talk about that. Looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Um, there's so much more context when it's said via audio, and you can listen to it at 2x speed. As far as I know, when you're live Zoom with somebody, there's no way to listen to them at 2x speed unless they've talked very quickly like I do, right? Um, I'm way more thoughtful and I'm way more helpful to my clients. I look much more smart and I can be more resourceful. When somebody sends me a message, I listen to it. Might be driving in the car, might be getting ready for going to the gym, listen to it, wait. I arrive in the parking lot of the gym, I send them a detailed two or three minute message back, pointing them to different resources, maybe copying a team member, and my team member can take it from there and we're good to go. Um, I, by the time my competition has scheduled a Zoom and they have confirmed that that Zoom time works for them, we've already traded messages and, and gotten the whole issue solved. It's lightning fast compared to other people. Um, and it allows me to defend my time because when you start a Zoom, it's like, oh, how are you today? Where are you based out of? Oh, great. Yeah, my cousin went there. And don't get me wrong, meeting in person, connecting via video is absolutely critical for important relationships, to develop trust, to get big deals and transactions done together. But 90% of communications with your team or other counterparties is nuts and bolts, moving things forward, moving things down the way. And for all of those types or screening your time up front, you have to defend your time and audio messages is by far the best way to do so in my experience. Um, so definitely encourage you to check that out and use them all the time with your team, um, really helps. So <clears throat> some examples of projects that require your extreme focus, interviewing hundred billionaires, doubling your business, finding six new investments for your self-directed IRA, you might need to go to 10 different investor club events or come, come to some family office club events before you make a single investment. So you really get a lay of the land. You learn new investment structures. You learn what niches make sense, et cetera. Um, it might take extreme focus to get that done. So just keep that in mind. Like what, what would be very exciting and motivating for you to get done that is not gonna get done if you don't have extreme focus. And then that makes it more worth it to do everything I'm talking about. Um, one thing I've done many times is have like a media fast. So for one year, I only listen to um, Brian Tracy book summaries every single day on the way to work when I lived in Boston. Uh, one year, I listened to every podcast episode from Dan Sullivan and read every book he ever wrote. Um, right now, I'm not reading any books unless they're written by a billionaire. Um, and then I'm interviewing the 100 billionaires. These are all examples of extreme focus for what type of specialized knowledge you get into your brain, which is how we started out this whole section. Um, Mark Cuban found when he worked at a computer store, his first job in college pretty much, that nobody read the computer manuals, including the owner of the computer store. And so here he is, this, seven, this like 19 year old kid, and he knows more than the owner of the store and every single customer of that store. They would all come in and be like, oh, well, how do I get this to work with my WordPerfect software? And say, oh, well, that's on page 79. Didn't you see that in the manual? Oh, they're like, oh no, there's a manual? Oh, okay. Nobody likes to read stuff. No one wants to put in the work. So if you have a hard work ethic and you focus and you outlearn, then you're gonna be massively ahead of everyone else. And if you can teach your kids that, if you can teach your team that, uh, it can change your life, change your business. That's why Warren Buffett reads eight hours a day. It's why David Rubenstein is trying to read 300 books this year. Billionaires are voracious learners. And it's not because they have all the time in the world. It's because they learned that that's what transformed their life, right? They don't stop doing what made them successful once they become very successful. And they're like, yeah, forget all that stuff. Now I'm going to create a whole new way of doing business. Um, yeah, if they wanted to, they could sit on a beach or play golf all day long. But they keep doing what works because it's fun when things are going well and works, right? So some actions required would be to figure out your top one to three goals that require extreme focus and figure out, you know, what if you could get done, what, what could you get done that would change your entire business or change your entire life? And what should your one pager look like? If you want a one pager template um, for you to fill out for yourself, just shoot me an email, richard at investorclub.com, or you can text me at 305-333-1155 and I'll shoot you 
that Word document. So you can create that and have it done today for yourself. That's nothing we sell. You don't need to buy it from anyone. Um, it's just something that really could transform your investments and your whole life, really. Um, getting to that, uh, perfect segue here, is the next topic of, I believe that everybody should aim to have the most fun year of your life. And if your goal in life is to play golf every single day, then great, you could probably find a way to make that grow your business too. Um, if your goal is to visit every country on planet Earth, um, you know, great, no problem. Um, but when I say have the most fun year of your life, I'm not encouraging you not to work anymore. Uh, I'm encouraging you not to do anything in business that's boring, that's lame, that's frustrating, um, that is stressful to eliminate most forms of stress that are unneeded. It's usually 2% of our clients causing half of our stress. Um, and make sure that what you're doing is exponential and that you're stacking and you're only working in good business models with good partners, with good employees. You know yourself well, so you just focus on what you're good at. You focus on working in owner mode, not operator mode. And if you have this theme of, I'm gonna make this year the most fun year of my life, you're a better example. It's a better legacy to live for others. If you don't do that, what you're subconsciously telling people around you is that I value money more than I value enjoying myself, having a good life, being healthy. And you know what? To get money, it's okay to sacrifice everything else. It's okay to drink alcohol because of the stress, get divorced seven times, and do all this other stuff, right? Um, and nobody really wants that if you think about it. Like, you don't want to be that example to people around you. So... Everybody, I think if you really think it through, would rather be having fun, be ultra wealthy, have great social relationships, be emotionally healthy while also being very successful in business, right? So having the most fun year of your life represents all of that. And since I started having that theme for myself, my life has drastically improved. So um, I would just encourage you to think about that as well and try to incorporate that if you can. So what does it mean for you? to have the most fun year of your life. What did you do last year? This is a picture of uh, Bali. Uh, we stayed there just before COVID. It's one of my favorite places in the world. And it's one of the reasons why I'm moving to Oahu with my family. It's the closest thing I can find to Bali with US healthcare and US police and uh, lower levels of corruption. Uh, um, and so figuring out for you what your legacy is, what you define success is, and what's the most fun for you is gonna be different than anyone else, right? So for me, I had to quit a couple of boards where I was spending four hours at a time on these board meetings. I had to quit helping another investment platform where I really liked the people, but it just wasn't a good investment in my time. Um, I had to fire stress off of my client team. And every quarter at our thousand person events, We'll have like one to three people that we have to ask not to come back or just kind of nicely not include in the next event um, just to make sure the community stays healthy and that we keep it fun and enjoyable for everybody there. So for you, what are the five things that you need to do to make it the most fun year of your life? I challenge you to think through that and write a few of those down as a takeaway here. Um, this strategy, we could have an hour long call on. I'm actually going to do a full day workshop on this next year uh, within our family office club. But this has been key to a lot of our success. And I know I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'll start going quick here. But um, in a hacker world, a brute force attack is trying a thousand different passwords until one works, hopefully, for the hacker, right? And then bad stuff happens if they guess your password, of course. Um, in business, what I found is trying all these different combinations of actions until you figure out how do I interview 100 billionaires? How do I raise capital? How do I make better investments? How do I scale my platform? And trying all these combinations is important. And the faster you learn, the more that your combinations are going to make sense. The harder you work, the more you focus, the more those combinations are likely to succeed. And I've also found that the more you do things in business that make other people thankful and you're helping other people up front, um, like creating a, a live stream on YouTube or doing a webinar, and if others find it very helpful, they're more likely to do business with you and help you. That's called reciprocation. So what I found is that when I try a whole bunch of combinations in a way that also creates reciprocation, then things change. So when I got out of college, I took everybody out for a cup of coffee in the Chamber of Commerce in the city where I was at. And when I found one person who I wanted to work for, she said, oh, you need seven years experience to work for us. And I said, okay, well, I'll just work for free until you know I'm worth it. She said, well, I'm not gonna make you work for free, but you know, I'll pay you this much. She did that and, and, and I said, you can fire me on the first day if I'm not good. And I figured it out and I did a great job and I made six figures when I was you know, 21 years old right out of my undergrad from a state university and no name university. And I made more than my professors did the month before. 
Um, but it was because of this strategy. It's not because I was uber smart. It's because I was uber hardworking and I made it negative risk for her. I said, I'll literally work for free and you can fire me in the first hour if I'm horrible. I've done that time and time again in my career. I don't have the time to tell you the other five examples that I usually go through, but this has worked when I started Family Office Club. It's working for me when I, as I grow billionaires.com into the number one resource globally on billionaire scaling strategies. Um, and it's worked a number of times in our business to scale us to the next level. So just having that mentality of trying a whole bunch of combinations, reversing the risk, making it no risk for the other person as a way to really scale, I found. Um, over time, what you wanna do is look at this whole food buffet of strategies we're talking about today and layer in what looks good to you now, right? If you go to the Ritz-Carlton brunch, you're not expected to eat everything. You'll get indigestion, right? But some of these strategies you can use right now. Some of these strategies you can use later. But just incorporating these and having in your toolkit a whole bunch of billionaire mental models. If I do this, this will probably happen. If I act this way, it's more likely to work for me. Having all those mental models collected directly from billionaires, from investors who speak on stage at our family office club events, et cetera, can be something that can be amazing for transforming your ability to structure, source investments, scale your platform, et cetera. Um, and we have a lot of fun doing this. Um, running our investor club is like a perpetual learning machine. And whether or not you ever come to one of our in-person events, whether or not you ever do anything with our team, just reading the billionaire books can give you a perpetual learning machine, honestly, right? In-person is a lot more fun, dynamic than just reading books. Um, but 110 of the 240 billionaire books you can get on Audible. And so we've had a lot of time, a lot of fun reading those, and we're gonna be ranking the top 50 out of 240 and recommending those top 50 so you can spend your time on the ones that we've already reviewed and we know are awesome. Uh, to start with, we have those 25 that um, we can provide you a link to if you can't follow along visually. Um, I see Vincent, you can't see the slides um, right now because you're following along via our uh, YouTube side of things, but um, just shoot me an email and I'll shoot you the slides at richard at investorclub.com. So on the investment side, you know, we are offering passive income partners. We have four different options there for investments. They all provide eight to 15% net returns per year. They all pay out monthly quarterly cash flow. They all just have a one year lockup. You're not in the deal for five or 10 years, like most real estate deals. Um, and we have annual financial audits on those funds and over six billion in assets under management. So it's more safe, more liquid, and more income than just about anything else that we've seen in the marketplace. If you want to learn more about that, you can easily work with self-directed IRAs. Um, the minimum is only $10,000. You'll see a mention of a, a $50,000. Um, for people who come in through this webinar, it's only $10,000. Just go to PassiveIncomePartners.com and you can click on Become a Partner if you want to learn more. Um, we have also our division focused on medical and dental practices at MedicalClinicCapital.com. If you're a doctor or a dentist and you want to help grow on your platform or if you want to invest into that space, let me know. The smartest investors I know choose just one or two niches in the operating business world and scale those massively. For us, it's scaling our investor club and it's scaling medical and dental practices. We personally don't look at other operating business types, but inside of our investor club, we have 7,500 investors, including pro athletes, billionaires, centimillionaires, angel investors, private investors, high net worth investors, pro athletes, um, and they have a full spectrum of investment priorities. So when I say that I focus on medical dental, it doesn't mean our whole investor club, it just means me personally with my balance sheet, but our investor club is very diverse and dynamic um, with all different investment mandates inside of it. Um, there's a few different ways to work with us. If you are creating a family office, if you need to formalize your family office, if you need to get rid of your other wealth advisor and layer on a new one while keeping your old one, or you just wanna to upgrade to a family office quality wealth advisor, and somebody that we've known for a long time and know will do a great job um, either structuring a passive income focused wealth management portfolio or a um, very tax efficient wealth management portfolio. Those are the two most common requests we get. Let us know. Um, for our investors that take the time to come to our in-person events, we look at the thousand people attending and then we say, oh, okay, Ryan or, or Sarah, whoever you are uh, who's coming, you said you're looking for this, this, and this. Out of the thousand bios, we thought that these four people would be amazing for you to meet. So we've set up these little five minute speed meetings for you, just with these four people, just to make sure that this event is gonna be very productive for you. 
Uh, in addition to that, we have 125 speakers on stage over three days at our next event. So it is massively valuable. We spend a million dollars hosting that event. Um, and we have more investors on stage per day than any other event. And anyone else who comes close to competing with us has two to four content streams. So you miss half the content or 75% of the content. Because if you go in a little side breakout room with 400 people or 100 people, and it's not in the mainstream, now you don't know what's being said in the other three rooms. And how many times would you have liked to have been in two of the streams at once, right? So we just keep one stream um, during the whole event with 125 speakers on stage. It's super fast moving. It's like watching an F1 race versus watching golf. Uh, other investment conferences are like watching golf. So we have the land development fund, housing equity fund, the housing lending REITs, and the preferred credit fund uh, through passive income partners. Two of those are equity investment funds, two are debt funds on the debt side, you're in first position um, and there are hard assets or, and personal guarantees back in your investments. And that's how we produce the eight to 15% net returns a year uh, net of fees. So again, this is our team. If you want to reach out, um, I encourage you to just shoot me a text message. That's 305-333-1155. Uh, um, also Richard at investorclub.com. So Appreciate uh, everyone's attention here today. Um, thank you. And I hope we get to shake hands and uh, meet in person sometime. Appreciate it. Awesome. Um, do you have a minute to answer?